about eight years since I first came across you and your business when you joined us on the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program at Aston uh, back in the day. Um, this afternoon, I want to um, give you all an opportunity to have a bit of an interactive discussion at the end of this webinar. So it's scheduled for 90 minutes, but I'm hoping that we'll be able to get over the formal content um, reasonably quickly. Hopefully it won't be too depressing for you. Um, I don't think that's the reason you sort of joined this uh, session this afternoon. Um, you're looking for advice, you're looking for support, you're looking for uh, tips on how you can work your business going forward. Um, so I'm obviously hanging around the end of the, the webinar for, for the answer to those questions. If there's something in any of the slides that you see um, that you want to stop and ask a question, as Mayank has explained, please just pop a note into the chat box and um, we'll, we'll pick it up and allow you to unmute and, and come in and ask me a question. Um, Mayank's given you a little bit of an introduction about myself. Um, I don't want to repeat that, but what I do want to let you know what I'm up to at the moment. Um, I split my time at home <laughs> between uh, working for government, British Business Bank, um, Bays, etc., etc., advising them on the uh, sort of support that they need to be giving small businesses, micro businesses, self employed at this time. Um, you probably would back to me and say, Well, I've been very successful. But I think, in terms of where we've come from on the 11th of March, uh, when we had a, the official budget, we've had probably about six mini budgets since then as uh, various lobbying groups have uh, put pressure on the Chancellor to think again about the way in which you're supporting um, the small business sector of the whole of the UK economy. Um, so I do a lot of work for government, I build scenarios, I do data analysis, I really hopefully point them in the right direction. I've been working on small business issues and policy for about 40 years. Um, those of you who can see me will know where my grey hairs come from. Um, and, you know, I have a lot of experience in terms of um, what the policy framework should look like. We are in uh, uncharted waters at the moment. I, I, in my lifetime, have not seen anything like this at all. Um, not a point I would like to um, admit to, but I think it's, it's very difficult to be very um, sure about the direction of travel in the next weeks and, and months. Another part of my activity is working with small businesses. I've been running programs, as Mayank has said, for, for many years now. So I do a lot of work front of house support. So in the last number of weeks, I've been doing podcasts with small businesses and we send out a newsletter every week from the Aston Centre for Growth. If you want to be in that newsletter, then please let uh, Joanna know who's um, the, the concierge for this uh, webinar. Um, I do a lot of podcasts. I talk to a lot of uh, small businesses. I try and understand exactly um, what the challenges and issues are so that we can feed that back in, into government in real time so that they can uh, listen to what's going on. What I want to do today is, is, is basically a, a game of two halves. Firstly, hopefully not to press you too much, but set the scene in terms of what we're looking at. I don't think that's probably going to come as a great surprise to many of you. Um, but then secondly, move on to, okay, what should you be doing currently in terms of whatever type of business you are? Um, can I have the next slide, please? Let's, let's get this uh, show underway, as they say. Um, this is um, a depressing slide in terms of the information. It's about a week out of date now because these um, surveys that you see referred to here are, are, are coming out in fortnightly waves. We know what the Office of Budget Responsibility said in terms of the fall in GDP. The macro economy is probably currently in recession. Um, I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. In fact, it just can't be. The uh, Purchasing Managers Index, which was published um, a couple of weeks ago or early last week, was 12.9, the lowest it's ever been ever. In manufacturing, it was um, about 24, 25, I think, uh, last week. That's the lowest it's ever been ever. Um, and obviously a number less than 50 is not good news. So we are off the scale in terms of our economy. So for you trying to keep your businesses afloat, trying to react to probably ch circumstances changing on a daily basis, um, it's a very, very difficult environment to 
be operating in. Um, there's been two special surveys have been uh, implemented since the start of the COVID-19 crisis, one by the ONS, which is the Business Impact COVID Survey, and the British Chamber of Commerce Tracker, which you probably see more often in, in social media um, than the ONS survey. Um, but I think the, the, the key point to note there is that um, we're picking up very clear trends in the first few weeks of the crisis and certainly since lockdown on the 23rd of March, um, 0.4 businesses have permanently closed. And that equates to about 85,000 businesses across the UK. And I'll come on and say a little bit about that in a moment. We've already lost 85,000 businesses from the stock of businesses. 25% are have closed temporarily. How temporarily that is, is a, is a matter of some debate. Um, and then obviously for those who are still operating, um, they, a lot of the workforce has been furloughed, so they're operating at less than optimum levels. And obviously turnover and revenue has collapsed. And this is one of the things that worries me about the, the, the you may have seen some of the, um, negative reaction to Sybils, which is the um, initial loan scheme that was pushed out by British Business Bank. I made a case to the British Business Bank that it was totally inappropriate for small businesses. The last thing that small businesses want um, at a time of revenues probably collapsing to zero is actually to take on more debt into the business. I think that's been proven by uh, events in terms of the low take up and the, probably the bad behavior of a number of the banks, if I can be so bold. Secondly, we saw yesterday the bounce back loans that came about as a lot of the lobbying we've been doing. Um, Mike Cherry from the FSB and Adam Marshall from the British Chamber of Commerce. Um, they've been in the forefront of that lobbying and I've been providing them some of the statistics to show that, look, if you really want to ensure the micro small business community are alive and well in six months time, you need to do something about getting these loans out the door. So I welcome what has happened with the bounce back loans. I think from what I can see since yesterday morning, it's working reasonably well. Billions of pounds has already left the banks to small businesses, and that's encouraging. We can talk a little bit about that later. Um, so I think that the job retention scheme obviously seems to have worked well. We've got 6 million uh, workers out of a total private sector workforce of about 24 million. Um, 6 million for, um, workers have been furloughed under that scheme as of uh, last weekend. Um, so we can see that the economy is closing down. So the question is, what are you doing? Before I go on to depress you some more in the next slide, let me, let me just think a little bit about uh, categorizing the business population. Um, I do a lot of work with uh, Be The Business, uh, an organization which until this crisis was designed to um, address the productivity problems in the UK. Um, but they're, they're talking about a sort of fourfold typology of businesses. Um, those that have sort of um, closed the door, turned up the heat and sort of closed down completely. That's what I mean by those that have closed temporarily. Um, there's another group of businesses that are trying to keep going, furloughing some of their workers. Um, you know, they've got still some revenues coming in, trying to think about how they can uh, keep the business going at all costs. If you are a hairdresser, beauty salon, nail salon, dentist, you're in deep trouble, of course, trying to keep your business going. I saw the issues today being raised about uh, dentists. Again, we tend not to think of dentists as small business owners, but of course they are. Um, and they've just had their whole uh, footfall uh, disappeared on them a number of weeks ago. The third category are people who are pivoting. Uh, this is a word we're going to hear a lot more about as businesses. Um, pivot to uh, different channels of delivering your products and services, and, and perhaps even pivoting to, to new markets in, in, in completely. And if you listen to our podcasts, um, we, we can send that out to you, and my um, can make them available on the MSD UK um, uh, website, that's not a problem. Uh, you will hear lots of examples of a lot of the small micro businesses we work with pivoting to looking at how they can um, think about delivering their services online. Um, obviously the classic stories are, uh, you know, restaurants moving to home delivery and stuff like that. Um, but we have a, a business who did a lot of uh, training, uh, circus training for young people. 
and um, Joe Fern is his name, and Joe has moved the business online, so he keeps training, and let, let's view Joe Fern as the Joe Wicks of circus training, if you get the point. Uh, everyone talks about Joe Wicks and his uh, impossible exercises. Uh, well, they're impossible for me anyway. Um, in terms of uh, the gym trade has been taken over by online classes, Pilates classes, um, you know, range, all, all, all the fad sessions you do at the gym are now being delivered online, which begs the question, will anybody go back to the gym before the end of the calendar year? If they're settling into homeworking, perhaps for those that are homeworking, um, and accessing their exercise regimes online. Why go to the gym? Why pay a fee to the gym if you can actually achieve the same results at home? So I think what I'm indicating there is not only are individual businesses pivoting, um, people are taking advantage to move into to spaces that have uh, been occupied by existing businesses. So while it's bad news for gyms, short term, perhaps even long term, it's actually good news for all the people who came and did the training, did the sessions at the gyms, these self-employed people who are actually able to continue their businesses by building up a clientele, which is actually um, perhaps even larger than what they could get at a gym session on a, on a Tuesday evening or a Saturday morning. Um, and then the final group of, of businesses. So think about people who are just, you know, batting down the hatches, you know, turn the key in the lock. That's one group. The next group, you know, at all costs, I'll keep this business going as, it, as, it, as I have done. Um, thirdly is the pivoters. And then the fourth group, and we have evidence of this, are those that are absolutely thriving at the moment. And I'll say a little bit about this later. And this is one of the positive things I want to, um, you know, make sure we focus on. Just because, as I've said, the economy is in deep crisis. It's in recession. Does not mean to say that businesses actually can't thrive and earn profits to sustain their business going forward. I am old enough to remember all the recessions since 1974. I was a young uh, student at university doing economics um, in 1974 when the oil crisis came, the early 80s recession, the early 90s recession, the dot-com bubble. You can see the pattern building here every 10 years. Um, the 2008, 78, the uh, great financial crash, as we call it. And now we've got this, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, health and economic crisis on top of a number of years of uncertainty in the UK economy where growth was absolutely zero. So, um, yes, that's the context. But what I've observed is businesses who actually um, sometimes turn in their best years in the midst of a crisis, which tells you there's opportunities. Now, you can maybe come back and say, yeah, but that's because, you know, businesses are exiting the marketplace and therefore someone has to take up the customers, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, that, that does happen. But I'm talking about people who are, you know, thinking very actively about their, their business model, um, not just changing channels online. That's the simplest version of that. But I'm thinking about, you know, the, the, the value proposition that you all have for your business. That's really important. You should, you take the time at the moment to think about how you can actually create greater value in the business that you've got to this stage. Um, and I think that's quite important. We'll say a lot more about that later. Can I have the next slide, please, Joanna? So this is work I've been doing for the British Business Bank. This will, this will not come as good news. Um, what, so what, what, what happened in the Great Recession, the financial crash back in 2007-8? Well, we lost uh, 200,000 firms. They closed and we lost 3.3 million jobs. Um, now those 3.3 million jobs, just to be clear, that, that, that was businesses closing and contracting. We had a compensatory increase of 2 million jobs in that recession um, because of businesses thriving, because of new starts. New starts did not stop in the last recession. So overall, we lost 1.5 million jobs. Um, in the last recession. I put on some West Midlands figures here. I've been using this slide for, um, I'm from Aston University in Birmingham, so I'm, I was giving it some context for uh, what happened in the West Midlands. Now, scenario two is taking the worst case scenario from the uh, Office of Business Responsibility, the Chamber surveys, and saying, look, 
if those predictions, if, if we fall off a cliff in, in say August, September time, when the cash runs out, because these surveys are saying, how much cash have you got? They keep going. That's a survivor mode. Basically, we're out of cash um, by about August, September time. If that happened, we're talking about 830,000 firms disappearing. We're talking about losing 11 million jobs. Now, you know, that's almost 40% of the private sector. That's the sort of scale of, you know, economic crisis this, this, this country is going to walk into. It's the same across Europe, it's the same across the globe, obviously. This is just, you know, scary numbers, I guess. What I do know already, we've lost that 80, 85,000 uh, firms, and I reckon that at the moment we're about 1.2 million jobs uh, disappearing. That's my estimate. So that's how far we're about a tenth of the way towards that really shocking figure of 11.4 million jobs. I don't think that's, well, what do I think? I'm not making any predictions here. Um, I don't know how bad this is going to get. All I will know is that there's very few firms being set up at the moment. That's fallen. But I do believe that those businesses who are surviving, pivoting, thriving, will actually be able to um, compensate some of that job loss to, to some extent. What worried me as it came onto this webinar was a report coming through that the Chancellor is saying that they can't continue with the furlough scheme. Once it's extended for a month, that's it. There's no more money. Um, and despite what we hear over the last number of years, this country has got no money. We have to borrow. Um, and I have no problem with that. We need to borrow at a time of, of national crisis. There's absolutely, um, there's, there's no ideology should get in the way of doing that. Um, this is this is like existential crisis for our economy and for, for our society, and we just need to borrow the money. But what worries me is that the chancellor is obviously thinking about, well, I can't keep underwriting uh, the small business sector and the private sector. My argument is that they need to until the autumn time. Absolutely no question about that. I've made that point known uh, in my discussions, um, but I'm afraid I'm not sure that's going to be a very successful one. So I hope you're all very vocal in your uh, various networks, making sure that these um, points are, are, are um, understood in Government. I know working with Andy Street, Birmingham, West Midlands, Mary gets it, Andy Burnham in Greater Manchester gets it. Um, but I, 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 I worry that uh, Treasury is beginning to panic now about the scale of money that's been underwritten. I mean, if you think about what I said earlier, you know, billions of pounds have left the banks in two days, all underwritten by 100% guarantee from government. Um, this is not cash that the government has actually had to find, it's just got a build it in somewhere as a contingency that if the, if the loans fail, um, you need to um, actually pay the banks. Okay, let's move on. Um, I see someone's working with Enterprise Nation to voice our concerns. I'm, I see some of these chats coming in, that's brilliant. Um, uh, Emma, Emma Jones has the ear of uh, government as well, so that's very useful. This is a piece of work I did um, comparing, you know, what's happening to the economy compared to last year. And I was looking at uh, incorporations and dissolutions. This is a bit like the excess mortality rate you may see in the, in the, in the daily uh, statistics. You don't see them on the government daily statistics. You see them elsewhere, obviously. Um, but you, you know, comparing to what, what, what would happen normally, and what you see on the left-hand side are uh, the number of dissolutions. And you can see that um, this is just before and after lockdown. The, the Financial Times asked me to, to, to do this see what was happening and um, what you can see is there's very little difference the lockdown on the 23rd of, of March didn't make uh, any difference to the number of dissolutions really um, you can see very little difference there um, and actually they they um, they fell after the lockdown um, we, we we're using daily uh, dissolution and corporation data here from companies house by the way which we can access uh, so it's in real-time data and then on the right hand side there's incorporations and what you can see here is a fall in the incorporation so basically people are really postponing the decisions to set up their business compared to uh, to uh, either side of the lockdown i mean I, you know it, it's it's a, it's a very tenacious entrepreneur or team of entrepreneurs who's launching a new business this week to be perfectly honest next slide please 
So this is what's happening um, on the terms of our corporations. So we're looking at January, February, and March, the first quarter of 2019, comparing it to 2020. And you can see that January, February looked remarkably similar on the left-hand side. Um, March saw a rise in, in the corporations last year, but it didn't happen this year at all in the month of March. The solutions on the right-hand side, you can see very clearly that um, March has been a very different year. Uh, different month rather this year compared to last. We've had an increase of 22,000 dissolutions since the 1st of March, which represents an increase of 70% on last year. There is a report on, on these data on my uh, Enterprise Research Centre website, which is www.enterpriseresearch.co.uk, so you can, you can read the full report. Next slide, please. I don't want to dwell too much on these sort of depressing statistics, but Nevertheless, they are part of the context to really understand that uh, from your own business perspective, you know, let's get real, understand the calamity that's happening out there, the carnage, road crash, describe it as you wish. And then you've got to say, right, well, what can I do to, to address that? Um, here you see some regional data on the, on the dissolutions and corporations. Um, it's clear that um, mostly it's, it's London, Northwest, West Midlands. There's been a very sharp increase in dissolutions in Wales, actually, but from a very low base, it's over, over doubled. Um, so obviously the orange is what's happening in March 2020, and the blue is March 2019. So we can see where the, the big uh, increases have been, and that's in the, in the West Midlands, Northwest and London. Next slide, please. Again, the sectors, not great surprises here, obviously. Um, in terms of wholesale retail trade, which is absolutely shut down, transport storage shut down information communications all shut down. Um, we've got business and professional services basically shut down. Um, so you can see that, and obviously manufacturing from a very low base, there's been a lot of manufacturing firms disappearing from the marketplace. Um, so all of the economy has been uh, hit, but obviously some more so than others. Next slide, please. This is um, something we did about two weeks ago. Um, I'm not sure how many people on the call are, are self-employed. Um, and obviously there was a little bit of good news today in the sense that if you get your application sorted out this week, register with your UTR number this week, you may actually get some cash. Um, well, you'll find out immediately if you're entitled to any cash and you should get your cash before the end of May. Originally it was from the 1st of June onwards, but to be fair to the HMRC, they've got their finger out a little bit to, to get this operating a bit earlier. Um, but what you see here is our estimate that there's about three quarters of a million self-employed who are excluded from the uh, self-employed um, package of support. Um, and it's to do with, and you've probably seen this in the social media, the new self-employed since May, April, May 2019. Um, my advice to everybody, anybody in that situation is get their tax return in to the end of, uh, to the 5th of April 2020 and um, start hassling. We're trying to get the, the Chancellor to move on this. Um, I've been working with Craig Beaumont in the FSB. It's difficult and again it's about this reluctance of uh, the Treasury to really have even more commitments of spending billions of pounds um, on, on supporting. However, if I was being sort of political with a small p, he stood up on the 11th of March and said, whatever it takes. Um, this diagram illustrates that it's not whatever it takes, it's about deliberately excluding the newly self-employed and obviously com company directors as well. That's been a big scandal. One of the other big scandals actually, and I'd be interested to hear how many of you fall into this category, is your business interruption loan uh, clauses on your insurance. Um, I'm working with a, a, a national lobby group um, to try to get some data on this. Um, uh, we've come across in our podcast a number of firms who have tried to claim, um, and it's obviously capped £50,000 on a business interruption clause, and they've been told that it's, that it's not eligible because the pandemic clause, which they have in their, in their insurance policy, does not mention COVID-19. Now that's the sort of nonsense the insurance companies are, 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 are throwing back at businesses like yourselves, which find, I find actually disgraceful, moral, um, and it needs to change. So again, we're lobbying um, 
through into Treasury, through into government to put pressure on the insurance company to behave. So we think about that. You know, a business can go to, the, say, uh, RBS yesterday, get £50,000 of a, a, a bounce back loan, don't have to pay it for a couple of years and it's 100% guarantee, that's fine. But if you've got an insurance policy, which you have paid for, and there's a business interruption clause in your insurance policy, which is capped at £50,000, you know, it's absolutely ridiculous that actually the government is forced to guarantee that amount of money, which insurance companies are sitting on, for no reason whatsoever. So you can see there's a lot of um, problems here in terms of how people are misbehaving. And we can name and shame. Um, government's doing its best, but they're starting to panic. And they're not listening as well as they should be. And that slide in front of you at the moment illustrates that. Next slide, please, Joanna. Right. Um, looking back at the Great Recession, um, this is a, from a webinar I did a couple of weeks ago um, for a global community. I, I run, as Mayank said, the Global Entrepreneurship Monitors Survey, which I've been doing for 20 years. And, you know, we, 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 you know, what happens in a recession? And I'm just using this one slide by way of illustration. The United Kingdom data point is in red. What we saw in the last recession was, a, you know, a collapse in the proportion of the population who wanted to start up their own business. They just found that look, we, this is not the time we postponed. It wasn't true for all. So again, you can see it didn't fall to zero. But it's a dip. There was a dip in the US, but obviously the, the, the levels are, are completely different. Um, and what you also saw in the, the Netherlands and Spain, by way of comparison, was a rise. It, it fell actually before the recession, but during the recession it rose. Where actually, you know, if you think about universal credit, the, the sort of the benefits, safety nets in Spain and the Netherlands are actually slight, slightly different. So what you can see there is that people, do intend to start up a business because they suddenly realize that, you know, again, if we have no, um, you know, in, in terms of um, taking control of their own financial independence as best they can. And as I've said, even in the midst of a recession, there's always opportunities as the, you know, bus businesses exit, leaving gaps in the marketplace or very small two, three person uh, businesses can be more agile and flexible responding to, to needs. So all the small businesses in this call, I mean, again, the, the advantage you have over some of perhaps your larger competitors is, you know, you, you can pivot, you can be flexible, you can be more agile than uh, other other folk. So what we see, we, we didn't see a fall in, in, in the level of startups that much in, in the last recession, but what we did find was it was it delayed the decision to start up. So that's part of the recovery period, if you like. Um, there's a, a question on Brexit popped up in the chat. I'm seeing some of these chat questions, by the way, not all of them. Um, this is what I call the double whammy, because the economy was not performing well in 2018, 2019. We had low levels of investment all last year. Growth was ticking over just over 1%. Um, we're now in recession. Um, so we, did, we didn't come into this crisis in great shape. That's what I would say. The analysis I saw up until 2019 was, you know, a, an economy beginning to stutter, contract in many sectors, levels of, of startup beginning to plateau. Um, so, you know, we've come into this in, 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 in you know, in, with a problem, demand was falling, obviously, and that will affect every business, um, whether you're B2B or B2C. So the issue that I see is, um, we need to just batten down the hatches. And I'm going to make a political point here, and many of you will disagree, I'm sure, but it's, um, you know, we've left the EU. That, that, that's, that's happened. So let's not get, you know, this isn't in any way seen as a, an attempt to, to go back and rerun all of the, those discussions of 2019. Um, we need to extend the transition period for at least one to two years. Uh, we need to just say, look, we can't do this. We need to get this economy back on an even keel again. We are, you know, <coughs> we really can't really press ahead, despite what politicians are saying. We have to get the deal done by the 1st of July. It's not going to happen. We're leaving without any deal, which means we're trading on terms which are completely 
uh, ridiculous in terms of WTO. Um, our small business sector uh, will be absolutely gutted. Our big uh, manufacturing sectors, aerospace, automobile, will be decimated. Um, our supply chains disappear as a result. We, we just need to sort of say, no, let's get this crisis over and go on with it. And what I'm hearing from politicians, I hope, is just um, bravado. Um, the likelihood of pressing the government, well, the likelihood is we are pressing the government to, to extend transition. Gove says no, Hancock says no, that's the last 24 hours. Um, what Johnson says, I have no idea, I mean, who cares? Um, but at the end of the day, they're not treating us very seriously as small business owners in this call this afternoon. You need to understand that people understand the pain that you're all going through. And yes, it's great the response that's been done in some areas, but um, it would be a great relief to all of you to hear right Let's get this crisis over. Let's see what sort of business I emerge with back end of 2020 or next uh, early next year, and then say right. Let's have some serious discussions about about leaving the EU with a proper trade deal. That would be my view. Some of you may disagree with what I've just said. I'll take that on the chin, but I am only driven by the data I see in front of me. Um, you know, if I accept the fact that we're leaving the EU, we've gone. So now we have to get on with the fact what's best in the interest of, of, of the, the economy. That's my only motivation. Right, enough of that. Move on, please, Joanna. Joanna, it's a bit of a, a fun image, but I think in terms of it, it sums up the turbulent times that we live in. There's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of volatility anyway, if you think about all the discussions about machine learning, artificial intelligence, um, how it's going to change the workplace, industry 4.0, robotics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was it was a very turbulent economy. You know these big macro influences, the an aging society. You know there was a lot of big societal trends at work out there. So as a result of all that, things are very uncertain. Sectors, individual businesses, you as business owners are beginning. Well, you know how do I react to these turbulent times? So there's an uncertainty there. Um, I would urge you to be novel and creative in your thinking. Embrace the uncertainty. Embrace the turbulence. Now, I, this is a slide from pre-COVID-19, don't forget. So I'm not saying that, you know, um, there's always turbulence, but what we're going through at the moment is turbulence times 10. But I think there's, you know, let's be positive about this. There are, there are, there are things out there that you can look at and see how you're... Um, contribution be, can, be, can be quite novel. It's ambiguous because in the midst of a crisis, you're not quite sure what to back. All in the red, all in the black, spread your bets. You're not too sure. There's still a lot of ambiguity out there. So I use TUNA as a bit of an acronym. Um, I picked this up from a, a colleague of mine in uh, the side business school in Oxford, by the way. It's not, it's not one of my own uh, uh, phrases, but I think it sums up where we've got to at the moment, the turbulence, the uncertainty that comes from the turbulence, the opportunity for novelty, but nothing's quite sure about the outcome. So the outcomes are quite ambiguous. So um, moving on, please, Joanna. Oh, yes, there's a bit of animation in that. Now, this is I'm moving on now to some positive stuff. Um, what I do for <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm not in front of uh, small businesses or not in the office, I worry about data. I play with the HMRC, ONS data sets on all your businesses anonymously, of course, so I can't identify any individual business. But I've got millions and millions of records on my computer at any one time. And I'm just making sure that I, as home working goes, I can still get access access to it at home, which is proving a bit difficult actually for, for legal reasons, but nearly there. So I play around with data. So what, what we did um, um, way back in, what, about nearly 10 years ago now, we set this project up. We, we, we look at cohorts of businesses. A lot of you hear discussions about, you know, high growth firms and scale ups. I'm not interested in that, it's an arbitrary, uh, concept of no real value whatsoever. I track businesses over their life cycle, much more important. Um, so what you see here, quarter of a million businesses were set up in 1998. 10% um, survived, so we're back to 26,000. Most of them, two thirds, hadn't grown, but um, there was a small number of about 
um, 2000, which grew very, very fast. And by 2014, 15 years later, they employed 110,000 people um, and collectively represented 16 billion sales. Now, the interesting thing about these 2000 businesses, all of them were less than five employees in, at startup. In their first year of operation, they had one to four employees and they grew exponentially. And on average, in 2014, they employed 55 people. And each of them were averaging about eight and a half million turnover. You probably all bite your hands off for those turnover figures with hopefully a decent profit underneath it. Um, so this is our 2000. We call it the M2000. That was a bit about you know, millennials and stuff like that. But it's really the 2000 firms that came out of that quarter of a million of startups. And they became businesses of interest, as the police would say, to our inquiry about how, how we look at growth over time. And... Um, <coughs> One of the things that I want to share with you, if we move on, Joanna, please, is this slide. 20% of them had their fastest growth period in the midst of the recession. There's a slight delay. These numbers, by the way, uh, the 2009-11, there's a bit of a lag in the data. So see that as the great financial crash uh, data point. So you can see that, you know, they, the, the great financial crash was the opportunity for them. Um, to actually engage in, uh, you know, driving their business forward at a faster rate than they've ever done. And even in the recovery period, they still had their fastest growth in the midst of recession. Now, obviously, one of the main features of that is businesses around them were closing and therefore the opportunities were being presented. What we actually surveyed these companies. Um, Bayes, the Department for Business, gave me some money to say, Mark, that analysis is interesting. We'd like to learn more. And what we learned was that in the recession, what were businesses doing? They were retaining key staff. So be careful who you let go in the midst of this current crisis. They were actually training their staff. Now, I know that's tricky when you furloughed individuals and legally you're not allowed to have any contact with them except to ring them up. Um, you know, Kush, you're, you're spot on. When your back's to the wall, you get more creative. That's what they, they innovated. They were doing all sorts of things with their service services and, 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 and um, products. So this innovation is not just about, um, you know, high-tech, shiny manufactured stuff. Innovation is also about innovation in your business model, um, as well as innovating the types of products that are suited. I mean, just, just look at the wonderful stories that have come out of the small business sector as... The private sector, the small business sector, has written to the, risen to the challenge of PPE and everything else. Um, yeah, I mean, I didn't know that about you can still train furlough staff. I, I wasn't aware, so thank you for pointing it out to me. Um, I'm not sure. It, it probably is. Is it informal or formal in the sense of what you're allowed to do with furloughed staff? Can you encourage them to train themselves, or, or are you? Able, I don't think you're able to pay for them to be trained. Maybe we can talk about that. Um, uh, okay, formal, yeah, it's um, interesting. Well, let's pick that up in discussion because that's not something, um, right, okay, everyone's jumping on me now to tell me I got that one wrong, so that's good. Um, you can't do a webinar without learning something. That's my, that's my uh, moral of the story, so thanks for that. Um, okay, so next slide, please. So recessions can produce stuff. So what I want to do now is, before we move into the discussion, is to look at strategies for survival and a reboot. Short term is this slide, and then medium term is the next slide. And you know, most of this is pretty uh, self-evident, but I just want to make sure um, you are, are fully aware. I mean, cash is really important here. You've got to keep yourself solvent. Um, and it's about chasing the invoices that are outstanding, especially if there's any, you know, name and shame the the large uh, customers are not paying you. Um, this is particularly important. Um, a lot of large businesses didn't move quickly enough. Um, they were still having um, payment terms of 30 to 60 days when you know, a lot of us were saying, look, can you just pay any invoice in your system to any micro or small business within 24 hours? So you've got to make sure you're um, keeping an eye on your, on your cash. How many of you have got a 13 week rolling cash flow forecast? It's not about a, you know, that one hand goes up from Ziggy there. Well done. I can't see everybody, but I'm hoping all of you have got this now. Um, 
well, a 13 week rolling cash flow forecast means every day you know what's going on. Um, but it's really important you keep an eye on the money and you're talking to your bank as a result of all of that. So you may be talking about um, getting loans and facilities. And I know some banks are giving you know, a bit of flexibility around current overdraft facilities and even if you overstep them a little bit. But making sure you've got that 13 week rolling cash flow forecast, it's not about six months, 12 months, three years, it's about the, the here and now. Talk to your bank about that, making sure you and your, your senior team know fully what's going on. Um, it's really important. Um, from terms of government support, look, it's not perfect. I know it's not, but there's no excuse not to be aware and apply for it. And point out the, 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 the problems, tell, you know, feed that back, whether it's through Enterprise Nation, FSB, Chamber, people like myself who can take these um, um, real issues back into government. I was talking to Bayes last week and they said, look, we need to know what's going, going, going right and wrong. Um, okay, it goes into a big bureaucratic machine, but it does end up on the minister's desk um, because we're taking this very seriously at the moment. Um, well, people are bullying SMEs into taking longer terms. I mean, I remember in the great financial crash, um, I was actually in Bayes when there was a meeting before, uh, alongside the one I was at, whereby um, the multiples were brought in and it was, um, Vince Cable was the Secretary of State. And also he was quite, um, no, sorry, I'm getting confused with something else. Um, in terms of the 2011 uh, issue about um, a growth review I was involved in. Um, it was Darling was, the, was obviously the, the, the chancellor at that time. Um, but the key point was that some multiples had 120 days average before they were paying their bills. Now, if you think about that, that's, that's on average. Some of them were were rising to 180 plus. So the worst offender was Tesco's, actually, just to name and shame. And um, we've had a lot of muttering in the last decade about, you know, if you don't pay within 30 days, you're on a, you know, a blacklist and it's published, et cetera, et cetera. We just need to get real about this. We've been dancing around it for far too long. Um, and it needs, needs to be done to make sure that these invoices are getting paid. If you've delivered the service, you've delivered the product, then you, you need to get your invoice paid. Um, simple as that. Okay, you've also got to look inside and look at, um, you know, to keep your business going, and obviously I don't know the current status of every business on this call, but, you know, what's the minimum viable proposition you need to keep surviving until September, October time? So it's about cutting, cutting the costs um, and, um, you know, making sure that, you know, you're not leaking money at this particular time. Now, again, the key thing is, Getting rid of the wrong costs can be quite detrimental to your business. So people in particular, are you, you know, if you furloughed, have you furloughed the right ones? Um, have you made people redundant that are actually quite core to your business, even though they're expensive? So be very careful about that, but revisit your, your cost structures. Focus on your core activities. Um, you know, many of you perhaps have been involved in a whole range of projects, a whole range of, of services. You need to go back to the core and make sure that um, you know you're aware of what, what what are the services and products that actually earn you the most money. Do do you actually know the uh, profitability of everything that you do, whether it's a you know for particular clients, who's your worst clients, who's your best client. So it's a question of really being aware of all of that information and making your decisions, taking your decisions accordingly. Um, I think it's important to talk to your customers and suppliers. You're having problems, so are they. What are they? Have they are they still trading? Have you actually found out who's not trading and who's not? Who's closed down? Who's hibernated? Who hasn't? Um, how are they changing their behavior? So having conversations with your customers is really important at this time. They may be uh, you know, undergoing drastic reduction and they maybe don't have time to talk to you, but at least gathering some intelligence on them is, is quite useful. Talk to your suppliers, and the agenda for the discussion is, you know, not about price, not about uh, an order, but just generally have a conversation with them about the challenges and issues that they're facing, and sort of work together with them as best you can. It may be that some of your customers and suppliers you'd prefer not to have a conversation with, but you know, that's um, 
that's always the case, but I think conversations at this time is really, really important. Pivot your business model, I've already mentioned this. It's about channels to market. What can you put online very easily? Um, it's really important that you think about your business model because obviously you've got customer segments which may have disappeared. You've got customer segments who are increasing demand. Um, the extent to which that, you know, that changes is probably more rapid than ever before. So you need to be thinking about how, you, how easily you can pivot your business model. What do I mean by pivoting your business model? I'm thinking, how do you make money? Who are your customer segments? How do you actually service those uh, customer segments? Is it through you know, making something and sending it in a van? Or is it a bit of consultancy? Whatever it might be, you've got to think about how you can do it more effect effectively. And what opportunities are arising as you discuss with your customers? Because the challenges and problems they've got can actually create some sort of light bulb moments in your own head. That's what I mean by keep your antenna switched on 24 seven. Listening to your customers and say, oh, actually, I, I, I could sort that out for you. So that's why it's not, don't just sit there waiting for your customers to come to you or send an email or do a bit of social media or do a bit of marketing, whatever. Get the conversations going, understand what they're going through, what problems that they have got at the moment. And then you can actually be the, the agile problem solver for them. But that's innovation. That's really, really important. That's what we see, you know, successful businesses who survive recession engaging in. I think this next point is really important about empathy with the workforce, whether they're furloughed or not. Uh, keep them keep them in the loop. Understand their own personal challenges. Your you know your business is, is your people. For those of you who employ people, maybe some of you on the call don't. Um, but it's really important that you bring them with you. There's ways you know we're all working now through Zoom, through whatever um, software we use to keep in contact with our staff. It's really important you don't just use it for work. Um, my colleague Paula, who's on the on the, the webinar this afternoon, we have a bit of a, a daily social call with all the staff in the Centre for Growth at Aston. There's 15, 14 of us. Uh, we keep it light. We tell jokes. We share films. We, we you know, these these are simple things. But to be perfectly honest, I think we've got a better integrated team of workers now than we ever had before the crisis came. And I know that that's really going to be beneficial when we get back to not worrying about our health, not worrying about being able to go out, but actually go back to the core business of running a center for growth to help businesses like yourselves. So I, I think that, you know, that, that's how you should be behaving at this stage. And I'm sure you're all doing that, but just a reminder. Um, keep the focus on the brand. This goes back to the point about how do you bully, bully larger companies who don't behave properly. Um, Yep, I think, it, yes, this whole d debate I've just said about empathy, it's about mental health of everybody. Um, um, and I think it's really important that, um, you know, we look after each other and not just obviously within the, in the business, but within the family and everything else. It's, it's really, it's, it's a hard time for a lot of people at the moment. Um, your brand is everything, whether it's you or your business. Brand's not a logo. It's about being seen to do the right thing in the midst of a crisis. And I can guarantee you could probably give me a list of 20, 50, 100 businesses who have been doing the wrong thing in the midst of this crisis. They are daily occurrences in my social media feeds. Um, don't walk away from your values. Don't sacrifice them. Make sure that you are seen to be doing the right thing for the local community in particular. But also, you know, what is your brand? Your brand is you, but it's also about your core values, your core competencies. A brand is not a logo, folks. I'm sure you know that, but it's about what you're known for and uh, what your values are, and uh, whether it's about looking after the social. Um, uh, business is doing badly. Um, I see people, you know, well, you know, <laughs> a simple example of um, Aer Lingus yesterday packing a flight from Belfast to London to bring construction workers, the Irish Navy story, I know it well. Um, but, um, you know, packing a flight and not respecting the problems that they're creating on that flight. Why would you ever fly with Aer Lingus? Why would you ever fly with Ryanair again in terms of what they're doing with, uh, you know, they're not giving people refunds on, on, at this particular time when cash is all important for, for individuals and families. So, they're, you know, that, that's what I mean by uh, businesses behaving badly at this time. Um, 
you know, and, and it could well be that, you know, we've had a lot of large scale examples of uh, businesses who should know better furloughing their workers, um, you know, putting them on the payroll of the, of the state, when in fact they have billions of pounds in the bank, they can very well not be a drain on the state. So there's, there's things like that that I can see. But I think from a small business perspective, it's, it's being seen to get involved in, you know, um, you know, a lot of businesses I know in the food sector around where I live are, are saying, look, um, we're focusing our attention on making sure that vulnerable households are properly fed, not just with the government's uh, minimum box of, of goodies, but actually, um, you know, the, a range of products um, which are really important for people's health. So it's it's about you know simple things in many ways um so it's about looking after your workers looking at what the needs of the community looking up and outwards and saying look you know we're all in this together what can we do but you know at the end of the day you still got to try and run the business if that's what you're currently doing and then finally joanna on to the next slide um i think you know i've got to use this time to think strategically um a lot of the stuff in the previous slide was you know what, what you need to be doing in the short term here, it's about um, what you need to do for, you know, where will the business be October, November, December, 2020? Where will the economy be? Where will society be? You know, where, where, you've got to set yourself some, some goals and objectives here and then the stepping stones about how you get to that position. Um, you know, you, you've all got, you know, you all know how much money you've got in the bank. You all know how much, you know, how you can keep trading along for I mean, my own university we have 101 days that we can trade for um that's it so that's you know third of a year effectively but a bit under um well, well under actually so you know 101 days cash in the bank what have you got in the bank what can you afford to you know spend um in terms of your staff your raw costs do deals with your landlords talk about saying look i'm not paying you the rent in the next three months but what i will do is you know after the three months when things hopefully pick up again i'll, I'll pay 120 percent you know you've got to have those conversations now to say look if i want to still be trading in the final quarter of 2020 i've got to you know this goes back to the very first point about looking at your cost structures you know strategically what are you going to how do you got to get there i need cash in the bank or i need to be talking to completely new customers now now is not the time perhaps but perhaps in a month two months time you want to think about the customers that you wanted to try and work with and never quite got. What are they doing now? Is it now is the opportunity for any, those conversations to take place? Maybe you've got some more time to do that strategic thinking as part of your business sort of uh, moves into sort of hibernation. Um, what did you learn from the last six weeks, seven weeks? What, are you, what have been the critical vulnerabilities um, that COVID-19 crisis has thrown up for your business? And I think that's really an important exercise because it'll feed into my final slide actually about how you how you sort of you know prepare going forward. I'm sure you've all got risk registers, but risk registers probably weren't even able to cope with what what has happened since the basically um, the end of January. Refurbish your business model. Now, I know we keep hearing this, the, the you know the new normal, uh, the cliche. Um, you know, but we're you know we're having discussions at the moment. Will there will there be such a thing as a as a as hot desking? Uh, will there be such a thing as open plan offices? I mean, the, the trend at our university was no one should have an office. We all thought that was great. Some didn't, obviously, but that's the direction of travel. I'm now talking to my dean. He wants to sell off the campus. He said, "You could you know you can work perfectly well at home. Why would I give you an office? Why would I give you an open plan office? Just get all me your work from home." Um. So what, what you know. What's society going to look like? And this is all. This is implications for transport, infrastructure projects. Maybe some of your businesses are connected to those. Um, so you know, you, you need to think about and, and be brave to say, look, what has served me well through to the end of 2019 is perhaps not the business model that I'm going to be working with um, from the end of this year onwards. So again, it goes back to that pivoting your business model, refresh it, refurbish it but really take some time out to think strategically about that. Get advice. Sometimes the best advice is build small groups of other like-minded business owners and just take each other's business model apart. Never, don't, don't get a consultant in actually. This is, a, I mean, 
and just to be clear, I'm, I'm not a consultant. Everything I do, I, 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 it's um, free at the point of delivery from my business school. They just pay me a salary, that's it. So I'm not, I'm not a coach, I'm not a mentor in the sense that that's my job. Um, but what I would urge you to do, and what I see working the best of all, is business owners getting together themselves and critiquing their own business models, critiquing what they're, they're seeking to do. So I would urge you to find those trusted business owners, not friends, they come later, but trusted business owners that you respect what they've achieved, you respect what they're, they're doing, and um, you let them into your business a little bit and discuss it. I find that's actually really valuable. And you know what? It costs you nothing. In the old days, it used to cost you maybe a, a you know, pint in the pub or a lunch or a, you know, a scone over breakfast. But I, I would really encourage you to do that. And it's not going to cost you a penny. The last thing you want to be doing is paying consultants fees and mentors fees to come in and get you to refurbish your business model. Believe me you are best able to do it yourselves. Um, so uh, entrepreneur to entrepreneur learning, um, yep, that's the best way to do it. bang has got a wonderful network of MSD UK. You're all part of that. So please, you take advantage of it. Um, yep, there's a lot of um, comments coming back in on that. Develop a ma crisis management plan. Believe me, you probably think the last thing you want to be doing at the moment is developing a plan for the next crisis. <laughs> um, but I don't mean a general risk register. I, I do risk registers for my, for my research center. I run in the university. It's a small business in its own right. Um, it's got to be part of a wider business resilience tool. You know, the, your risk register is, you know, what's the likelihood of this happening? And uh, what's the mitigation? Well, you can all put those together. But if I go on to my final slide, and that is really my final slide, <clears throat> what we've been doing as a project at... Um, in the Enterprise Research Centre, which is a, a joint venture between Aston and Warwick Business Schools, it's working with JP Morgan to, build, to, to develop a resilience toolkit that they work with a lot of small businesses, uh, individuals, self-employed through to larger small businesses across the world. And what we've been doing is building a toolkit, and we're, 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 we're testing this at Oxford at the moment. Um, uh, Oxford Innovation are putting it in, into uh, action and we're hoping to do the same in, in, in the Midlands and perhaps nationally. So watch this space on that. Um, but, you know, the Resilience Health Check, how resilient are you and your business? There's, um, you know, it's about you as an individual. This goes back to the point someone made in the chat about mental health. How resilient are you? How have you found it in the last six, seven, eight weeks? In terms of the drain upon you, your energy, your family, everything else, you know, things have changed dramatically for all of us. But your business owners, and I can imagine the changes. How resilient have you found yourself? Have you felt like giving up? Have you sort of have you been perhaps invigorated by by, by you know having to really roll the sleeves up and engage? And someone said earlier, when your backs are to the wall, you get creative. Um, so it's about the checklist about you know uh, what are the key areas you need to focus on. Is it about key staff? Is it about key customers? Um, you know, if you lost a key customer, you, you, you just out of the game completely. Um, so finding out about your own resilience is important, both from the, you know, if this happened, would the business fall over or not? That's the, that's the blue stuff. The analysis stuff is, you know, what, what do you need to worry about um, in terms of, you know, what could happen to the business? Have you captured everything? So trying to sort of play scenarios of some risks to the business is really important. Um, and then, of course, this leads into how do I put a crisis plan in place? And, you know, this is what we're looking at now in terms of, right, if this happens, who's in charge? Who's delegated to take action? Um, you know, and so in, in the business of, you know, some one of you got ill, you're in hospital, you're intubated, you've got COVID-19, right? How does the business you know, have you got a planning tool that enables your business to function? That's what I mean by the crisis hitting your business. Who's empowered to um, take charge? Who's empowered to make decisions about finances, about contracts? Who's empowered to actually engage in the whole problem-solving stuff? Um, so again, getting involved in crisis planning is, is, is really important. But how you put it in place? and uh, everything else that goes with it. So look, I've been talking long enough, Mayank. Um, I've enjoyed looking at some of the comments in the chat. 
Um, but I'm very happy now to hang around and share my doom and gloom some more with a smile on my face, but also more importantly, get engaged in a bit, bit of a positive conversation going forward about um, how we can get these 21 folk on the call into a major um, position of positivity. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for a wonderful webinar. And I, I know you raised so many issues and I was reflecting on how uh, me and my team has managed this crisis over the last six, seven weeks and how we are preparing ourselves. And it's important to uh, think about innovation, new ideas, you know, re remodeling your business is very important, but also empowering your people. You know, uh, crisis management, uh, I think one of the best way of doing that, what I'm doing at MST UK is empowering my team to take individual responsibilities so that, you know, everything doesn't fall on me or, you know, so that's, that's, that's very important. But I would open the floor for any questions to, uh, so please unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, Kush. Hi, um, thanks very much, Mark. Uh, which industries do you think, based on your experience, would be successful during this recession and after this session, a recession? And why do you think that? I, I think that, um... I don't see it as a, as a sectoral discussion, Kush. I see it more as, you know, how the business is organized and how you respond to the challenges. So I don't want to give a sector re reply to that. Um, I mean, obviously we've seen the, the you know, the, the whole carnage of the hospitality sector and cinemas, theaters, and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's, um, you know, they, 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 you know they, some of those will bounce back, some won't. But I think what determines the businesses that will succeed uh, currently, and those that um, will continue to, to succeed are, are those that are responsive, who understand how the markets are changing, how trends are changing, how people's tastes are changing, and you, you, you understand what that means for your business. And I mean, it could well be, Chris, you, you know, what, what's your business at the moment? Just remind me. Um, so I do lots of training and coaching. Yeah. Especially so again, for, for you, it's, you know, that that's going to it depends what you're training and coaching in but i think the point is that um and i hope you didn't take my point about coaching and training too personally what i said a few minutes ago um, <laughs> well, that's yeah. um it's um I, I i think you're going to have to think about ways of delivery um and getting people to obviously pay for that at the moment is perhaps difficult so you've got to think ways of hooking your your customers in without necessarily get, getting them to pay you in different ways. So a bit of loss, lead, loss leading. So it's about how you approach your customer base, which is important. That's what, that's what, well, that's what I mean by doing the right thing in the recession, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, you know, those landlords who insist on their um, rent being paid, will you stay with them in, when the lease comes up for review? You know, and I think there's some serious questions there about, you know, the, the, the amount of floor space that perhaps businesses will require going forward. So you've, you've got to be, um, you know, I think it's about adapting your, your business and being agile and responding to the trend and responding quickly to what you see happening around you. And I'm, I'm not giving you a very, I can't give you a sector answer. I think every business sector has an opportunity. When I look at the businesses in my data that, that grow fast during the recessions, and those, those, you know, businesses have the fastest growth period in the recession. You, you, know, you, you know what I find? There was a fish processing industry. It was a waste management in, industry. It was all sectors of the economy. And you, but you know what separated them out? It was, um, both of them were ethnic minority business owners, by the way. Um, it was their determination to not let the crisis take their business out of the marketplace. They just, they, 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 they changed um and you know you, you, it, it was it was about doing the right thing in many ways but it's um it was it was about how they, they themselves were motivated to keep the business ticking over yes they cut costs but they were able to keep their customers um um you know on board with them working with them and that was really important great thanks very much for that any further questions? 
I'd like to ask a question. Thank you very much, Mark. This is Michelle Hi, Michelle. Hi, from Dynamic Events. Um, so obviously the events industry is one of those sectors that have been gravely affected by this whole coronavirus. I wonder what your thoughts were in terms of what um, the industry could be doing right now to get us through a part of lockdown and what you think the impact will be post-corona when we arrive at our new normal? Well, you know, it's very hard to predict what that new normal will be, but in the events industry, by definition, you gather crowds together. And I think at the yeah. moment, um, I think what you should be doing at the moment is having, you know, if you've got current events, they'll obviously have to be cancelled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what well, doing the right thing is coming to some arrangement with your customers. You may need to hold on to their cash for cash flow reasons, but you've got to understand that the customers need their money back. So it's coming coming to some some arrangements. So think think creatively about that, about what you can do to sort of keep them on board. You know, understand. Look, I'll get your money back to you, but I can't I can't give it all to you at once. I'll, I'll give it back to you as quickly as I can, or whatever. Um, or you know, what I'm what I'm hearing is, you know, can you put your events online? What is the event we're talking about? Can we actually say, well, look, I'm not going to give all your money back because actually I want to build the brand of the event or the business who run a range of events, and I will be doing it in a different way. I mean, a lot of musicians, a lot of gigs, a lot of orchestras, choirs, etc., are going online and trying to, you know, keep in touch with the punters who would come to a, a church hall or a large auditorium for an event. <coughs> and that's, re that's really important. Um, it's that trade-off, Michelle, between, look, I've got the cash for an event, I've had to cancel it, and I really don't want to give the cash back because that's my business. But it's about yeah. thinking of ways in which you can engage with your customer base. And then going forward, I think, yeah. you know, I don't think anybody wants to go and gather in a, you know, in an in a, in a, in a upstairs pub room or a theatre probably in the next six to nine months. You know, there, there's no appetite for going into crowds. I mean, I, I, from a personal point of view, I, I just won't do it. Um, so what sort of an event are you going to be able to do? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky one, Michelle, but I think you've got to spend this time thinking about, okay, how far can I push this? You know, the good news is I don't, I don't have to book a hall if you're putting on an event. You can, and you, you don't have to pay traveling expenses for a band. But what you can do then is, is, is invest in the technology to ensure the experience uh, is different because it's not in a, an audience where we're all celebrating or going along with the, with the event. Um, but we have to be innovative or indeed Michelle bluntly events are not what you're going to do you're going to have to move out of the sector because there's just not enough uh, margin to be gained by doing what I've just been talking about that you maybe have to think about taking your talents and do something else but before you do that I think it's about being you know what, what can I do to build a, a reputation of taking my events online and doing them in a very professional way. Look, we've seen the, the sort of video nonsense, the poor reception and everything else. Um, maybe it's not to do them live, but to make sure they look professional and everybody can can really engage with them. Some, some of the stuff I'm really enjoying at the moment is, the, is BBC4 in terms of some of the, um, the programs they've got uh, late of an evening on people, you know, rock stars are long since dead or you know the, 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 for me it's a substitute for for events you know um but at that level of production is really important michelle not sure i've answered your question but it's a tough time for people who've got events on the calendar except if you're the jockey club we are here today when they go back and get the races up and running again they would of course and so would government because they get a lot of money hi mark Just, hi hi mark it's uh, ricky from uh as uh, technology. Um, just following on from Michelle's question, last week um, we got an invite to, so we, we do the tea and the sticks, as you know, Mark. I've got them sitting on my counter here. <laughs> good, good. Um, so we got an invite from a company based in, in France that have organized an event where it's going to bring in Tesco buyers, Metro buyer, casino, all the big large multiples across Europe into a room where we'd have an event 
and uh, the, the suppliers, the brands would come in and present and pitch to the buyers. And there'll be breakouts using these, these new technologies like Zoom, where you'd go away separately and mm. have a one to one with the buyer. And that's in, in substitution to actually going to France to that um, meet the buyer event. So th there's things coming out like that now. Well, and the technology's got to improve. I mean, I mean, Zoom, I mean, the shares in Zoom have become astronomical. There's an issue about encryption and security with Zoom, by the way, but that's, uh, I'll leave that for another day. But I think we're going to find that, that's what I mean, went to Michelle, but it's about being professional. It's not about sort of a, an amateurish um, thing online, whichever, whichever, which falls over and stuff like that. It's, it's really, we've really got to, and of course, what does that come back to? Investing in infrastructure and broadband mm -hmm. for us all. This has brought it home to many, many thousands of people that, that we've got to, if we're going to, have a different way of working. We've got to invest in the interest. Never mind HS2. Let's get proper broadband for everybody. You know. I'm sorry. That's <clears> another <throat> another semi-political <laughs> comment. There you go. But, but I, Ricky, you're right. We do think we can do things differently. Yeah, and I think MSD UK thrives on organizing events, and you know we had to look back at that, and you know we are doing as Ricky said, we are doing a virtual meet the buyer uh, in June, and also a virtual trade show. And we have, uh, you know, looked, shopped around for the best platform that uh, we can use mm. uh, that gives everyone a very good experience. And so in September, we are doing a virtual trade show. And in June, we are doing a virtual meet the buyer. So uh, as, as you said, Vicky, it's just about trying to be innovative and find the right solutions. So I, I just wanted to uh, say a comment because in February, we were pulling out the um, risk register from the uh, side course and on, on cohort 12. And what on my risk register was um, getting a, a pandemic in Asia, the SARS or something like that. So that was on the risk register. What I didn't put on the risk register was if it comes to the Western world and this side. And, well, uh, there you go. <laughs> but seriously, we, 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 we were just, I mean, you know, we, we, I'm pretty critical of government and they're slow to react, but. I think everybody here in the UK was slow to react from an individual mm. perspective. Yeah. We just did not think it was going to happen to us. No. No. You know, really, we really, really didn't. And if you look at the evidence this morning in the select committee, um, it's clear that, um, you know, people coming from Spain and Italy were the major reasons why we got this. Yeah. This was not a native COVID-19 virus. It came in no. and we could have stopped that. We just, yes. I mean, you know, Five, I mean, even, even our supplier. football supporters from Madrid coming in, ridiculous. Cheltenham, Cheltenham racing, ridiculous. And even our suppliers in, in Europe still thinking it's a, oh, this is just a flu. It's just a flu. No, we were, we were all very slow to react. But the point is that now, you know, you've, when, you, when I talk about last slide about crisis, crisis management tool, you've got to think of the worst case ever thing that could happen. And then to try and work out, well, what is it I need to do as the business owner? What do I need to, to empower, as, as Mayanka said, his, his team to do? It's really important. And then, you know, what, what, what's going to knock your business over? The worst thing that could ever happen. And who, who, who would have guessed a year ago we were talking about this? Yeah, true. And what right. we're doing at the moment, on the opposite side, on that side of the world, things are picking up and their, their behaviours have changed slightly. And we've just got a calendar of events coming up that we're planning well, for. This is also the thing to bear in mind. I've, I've sort of maybe given the impression this is a, you know, we're, it's a UK thing and, you know, we, we are in a global world and therefore we need to be thinking about how we can reach out and sell our services and products to uh, economies which are beginning to perhaps, um, you know, bounce back a little bit. But, you know, I still think it's far too early. I think we're going to have to find this with us for a number of months, the second and third waves of this virus take off, um, you know. But, you know, look, look, look at the happy, smiling faces we've got on the webinar this afternoon, Mayang. You know, you're, you're not down and out by any means, are you? No, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I would like to add over here for every business on the, on the call is that MST UK did two big things, you know, major things. One, we supported all our businesses by announcing that we will not be charging membership fees for one year. And we made that offer to everyone. Uh, secondly, uh, there were a number of businesses in our network that were providing COVID-19 essential services. And since the last, over the last six to seven weeks, our corporate members have purchased more than 5 million worth of uh, products and services, essential supplies from our suppliers. And what we did was we now, last week, we launched a COVID-19 marketplace on our website. 
which has all the suppliers that are providing, offering any assistance supply, uh, and it's open to public, you know, not only just to our corporate members. And we are seeing so many of our members buying from them, you know, whether it's masks, PPE, you know, uh, and anything to do with COVID-19. And I think and any one of you who is on the on the on this call and don't are not aware of that, just uh, reach out to my team and we will add you on to that marketplace. I, mean, I think Mayank, I'd like to make sure that everybody got access to the podcast we've been doing. I think we've done 10 and 11 of them now. Um, yeah. You know, with, with just businesses like yourselves that, um, you know, just listen, hear people talk. Yeah, I think what I've asked uh, uh, informed everyone is that after this call, we will send out a link to the podcast and we'll also add that on to our social media channel and also on our website. Yeah. A copy of this presentation would also be sent out to everyone. Any last questions? We have got a couple of minutes. Um, I'll give it a go. If that's okay, I'll just switch on my video. Hi, Hi I'm not sure if that's on. Perfect. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep, yes, absolutely. Yes, so um, given cash is key, and well, we don't know where cash is going to end up, whether it will end up in the digital economy, whatever. Um, would you suggest? Um, doubling all your efforts on, um, you know, getting the business going, being creative, or if there's an opportunity to uh, make cash in sort of like an alternative business alongside your business, is that something you'd recommend as well? Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I'm smiling because I remember talking to one of the businesses on the Goldman Sachs course that um, they, in the midst of crisis, when the business was sort of stuttering a little bit, um, in the in the last financial crisis, they uh, they actually decided to import chocolate fountain streams from China, just as a container load, to get them out, to get cash into the business to enable them mm -hmm. to actually keep their core business alive until such times as the, the demand picked up again. So I find entrepreneurs will do anything for cash, but it shouldn't. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean that the way it sounds, but in other words, that. They will, I do get it, yeah. <laughs> they will do everything to keep their business alive. And if it means importing chocolate fountain streams from China as a one-off to get cash in the business, to enable them to deliver in the next quarter, they'll do it. So I'm not answering your question directly. Yeah, Sarah. no, that's fine. It's, well, my concern was, um, will that confuse people if you're just doing something completely different. Look, you've got to be really careful because obviously mm -hmm. um, when I looked at there was two people around that business and they argued with each other about was this the right thing to do and did we want to be known as suppliers of chocolate fountain streams at weddings and bar mitzvahs and stuff like that. So I think there was an issue there. You've got to be careful. When I said earlier about your values, this is my serious point, right? About your values, your brand, you've got to keep it alive. So doing silly things to just generate cash is not all. You've got to make sure that even, even if you hibernate your business a little bit, you know, don't walk away from the brand you've built and the values you've got in your business. That's my serious point on that question. Yeah, yeah, because there's a lot of potential in the knowledge market. So it's more uh, around training and um, using your skills for people who need it at the moment. So things like webinars and so it was kind of around that area. Yeah, I mean, you know, this is the, if this is what you're in, then you've got to think about ways to reach your market, reach your customers. That's, that's the key. But don't chocolate fountain streams. No, let's not do that. No. We're not allowed to gather at these events to consume the chocolate fountain streams anyway, so it's a rubbish <laughs> idea this time around. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think we are just coming to 5.30. Uh, uh, let me first thank Mark for, uh, you know, taking time out uh, to join entrepreneurs. I know you love that, you know, he, he, you enjoy meeting entrepreneurs. So this is, this is something really useful. And also, uh, thanks to everyone, all the businesses who take time out because you have so many other options, you know, webinars are all around, but you selected because it was Mark. Thank you for that, you know, and we will send out information to everyone about, uh, the podcast that Mark is doing, but also keep in contact because with MSD UK, what we are trying to do is make sure that community is together, community engage on a regular basis, join our weekly town hall meetings because, you know, 
some of you have suggested how can we connect with entrepreneurs join every tuesday 11 to 12 we have a town hall meeting with all the entrepreneurs and you will you will find and will meet so many like minded entrepreneurs and share your common challenges so do do join that but uh, from every one of us you know mark thank you so much for your time it's an absolute pleasure now i can see, see you all at last <laughs> Absolute pleasure. Look, uh, keep in touch. Mayank knows where to yeah. find me, and I know some of the other other people on the call know where to find me as well. So anything you need, please come and connect. And I wish you well. And sorry for depressing you a little bit at the beginning, but I'm pretty confident that I will see you lot in six months' time, and we will be in the business. Okay. Take care, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.